Hey, what's up, you guys? It's Connor, and today I'm going to be continuing my 2019 reading wrap up with books 61 through 70. These are the videos where I do shorter reviews of all the most recent books that I've read. I don't go into spoilers, so don't worry about that. If I've done an individual review for a book, I'll leave that linked up in the card symbol as well as down below. So let's just get started. The 61st thing that I read in 2019 is The Inexplicable Logic of My Life by Benjamin Alidi Sanz. This one follows a boy named Sal Salvador. He goes by Sal. He was adopted by his father Vicente when he was a very young child, so all he really remembers is living with Vicente and him being his dad. Vicente is gay, and so at school, Sal is starting to be teased about that, and people are starting to say things about his father and about him. He has a best friend named Samantha, and he also has a friend called Fito, and throughout the course of the story, it's just about him living his life as things start to change, as he starts to have questions about his biological father. He's starting to find that he's getting into fights when he was always known for being a very well-behaved good kid, and so that's thrown a monkey wrench in everything, and it just follows him during this time period. This book really deals with death and grieving and uncertainty, so know that going in that it has a bit of a heavier feel to it. There are some characters that die and there's a lot of grieving and just emotions <laughs> involved, but I did end up really, really enjoying this one. I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. His other popular book is Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe, which I enjoyed fine enough, but I wasn't sure how I'd feel about this one and I ended up really being invested and really loving these characters and seeing them go through everything that happens and grow and change and figure things out. I really related to Sal's sense of floundering. He doesn't really know what's going on. He doesn't really have a direction for his life. And I think that a lot of other people will be able to relate to that as well, because sometimes in your life, you're not going to have a very strong direction that you're heading and you just got to figure things out as you go along. So I definitely found that Sal was very relatable to that. I love Sal's father. Vicente is like the perfect dad, basically. He's such a good person and he is such a good role model for Sal and he's so understanding. He just really gives Sal space to figure things out while also being there for Sal if he needs it. I loved Fito. I loved Sal and Fito's relationship. Sal is such a good friend to Fito and Fito has really been through some tough times and he is not in the greatest of places at the beginning of the book so I really like that they're there for each other and their friendship just grows and grows and grows throughout the course of this story. I also really liked Sam. I did find that she could be a bit overbearing at times and I probably would never actually be friends with a character like Sam but I liked that her and Sal are so invested in each other and they're best friends and I liked her through Sal, but I don't like her on her own. I do think that Sam goes through a lot of personal growth in this as well, so I liked seeing that, and I think that Sam, at the end of the story, is someone that I might be friends with, but her at the beginning was a bit much. <laughs> I will say that this has had some valid criticisms. One thing that I see a lot of people comment on is that there's a lot of talk in here about who's a real Mexican and who's not. If you're Mexican and you don't know this, or your Spanish isn't good, it almost suggests that you're not Mexican enough. That's kind of addressed in here because a lot of the characters feel that they're not enough of either. They're not enough American. They're not enough Mexican. But I've seen some people take issue with how that's handled. I guess there's also really enforced stereotypes in this. Sam is really the, the like lead female character in this and she hates on girls consistently. And she really makes a point that she's not like other girls and I wasn't a huge fan of that. And then I also wasn't a huge fan of how Sal viewed his father as being really straight for being gay. I don't really understand why the author took that stance or had his characters take that stance when he could have been promoting a lot of acceptance and everything like that, but instead it enforces that like more masculine gays are better than more feminine gays and I just don't agree and I don't really like that message. So there are definitely some issues with this book, but I really found myself invested in the story and invested in Sal. So I ended up really loving this. I think I ended up giving it like four and a half stars or four stars, but there are issues. So know that before going in, if any of those things are going to make you irate or make you really mad, maybe give this one a skip. But I 
personally really connected with it and really enjoyed it. Bit of a weird one, but I did read this one and I did really enjoy this one. Then I read The Last Guardian, which is the third and final book in the Dragon's Blade trilogy by Michael R. Miller. I may or may not do an individual review on this, so if I do decide to do one, I'll leave it up in the card symbol. I'm undecided as of filming this video. I did do individual reviews for the first and second book. They're non-spoiler. I'll put them up in the card symbol or down below. This one follows a character named Darnawir. He is the Prince of the Dragons. At the beginning of the book, I forgot to say that dragons in this world just look like humans. They're just bigger and stronger and live longer, but they don't have wings and they're not scaled or anything like that. At the beginning of the book, there is a force that is attacking the dragons and the dragons are going to lose. Darnawir is mortally wounded and a wizard resets him to a baby and he's raised by humans. And this series follows him as he kind of retakes his place as the leader of this dragon kingdom and how the dragons are trying to reclaim their homeland and everything like that. And this is the last book, so I can't really go into details about the plot of this one specifically. I will say that I didn't really enjoy this all that much which is so disappointing. I really enjoyed the first two books in the series. I think I ended up giving them both four stars or something like that. This one I gave two and a half stars to. I felt like the ending was not well executed and it almost seemed like the author just wanted to be done with it. And so they were like, okay, and this is the ending, which was really disappointing because the writing is quite small and it isn't the shortest novel. I think it's 400 and like 40-ish pages, so I was really invested in this story, I was really invested in this characters, and then for it to end so flatly was really disappointing. I wrote up my notes to do a review, so I probably will end up doing that just so I can talk about this book without bashing it, because I don't want to bash it, <laughs> but I was so disappointed. I was so just like, that's it? <laughs> that's all we get? for spending how much time with the characters that we spent? It just doesn't feel like an ending, and I think that that's my main problem with it, because it's just not very satisfying. So, didn't really enjoy this one. After that, I read Tunnel of Bones by Victoria Schwab. This is the second book in the Cassidy Blake series. I did do an individual book review for this, so I'll leave that in the card symbol if you want to check it out. I also did a review of the first book, which I'll leave linked down below if you want to check that one out. This series follows Cassidy Blake. She's a young girl, and she is able to see ghosts. In this series, her parents are filming a TV show about different haunted places around the globe, and she has to go to these different places with her parents and has to deal with all the ghosts that are in these different places. It's a really fun middle grade urban fantasy series that I've been enjoying. I did like this one a little bit more than the first book, but I do think that there's still some room to improve. I ended up giving this one four stars. I really like that in the second book, we found out a lot more about Cassidy's best friend who is a ghost, but I'm still waiting for the cat to play a bigger role. I think that Grimm needs to have something else going on besides being really upset and being in a crate and being brought around the globe. It almost seems cruel <laughs> to have him traveling so much because cats don't particularly like being in crates and traveling around. So I really hope that Grimm is made a more important character in this series. I definitely will be continuing with this one. After that, I read The Halloween Tree by Ray Bradbury. This one I also did an individual book review for, so I'll leave that up at the card symbol as well as down below. I actually did a book and movie review on this because I originally experienced this story as a cartoon when I was a child, and then I found out that it was a book and that it was by Ray Bradbury. So I had to read the source material as well. I ended up giving this one four stars. I really enjoyed it. I liked certain aspects of the movie more than the book, and I liked certain aspects of the book more than the movie. I think overall, I kind of prefer how the story was done in the book more. I like that we don't find out some big piece of information until a lot later in the book. In the movie, it's given to you at the very forefront. So yeah. I ended up giving this one four stars. If you want to know more of my thoughts, check out that review. It's a really fun Halloween time middle grade story. I then picked up Janitors by Tyler Whitesides. This is the first book in a middle grade series. It follows a boy named Spencer at his school. He washes his face with this soap and it ends up burning his eyes and then he's able to see these little creatures around his school after that. He finds out that the janitors of his school may be doing something that is harming the students of this school. And so Spencer is trying to save the day and trying to save his school and save the other students out of school, everything like that. I do think that this book is quite similar to The Candy Shop War by Brandon Mole, which is funny because this book is blurbed by Brandon Mole. I don't want to spoil anything about this because there are some shifts in the story that happen along the way that are fun 
to read for the first time. I do like that Spencer teams up with a girl named Daisy who is bullied at their school and they team up to save the day. I do think that the premise of these little creatures being responsible for making kids stupid is interesting but weird because I don't really understand the motivation for why we're trying to make the kids stupid. Like it doesn't really make all that much sense. And it kind of even talks about this in this book that it doesn't really make sense. Maybe it's explored in the future books, so we'll see about that. But I did enjoy this one. I think I gave it three and a half stars. It's a fun ride. It's definitely for a little bit of a younger middle grade audience, maybe kids that are going from chapter books into middle grade. So I would definitely recommend it for that group. I then picked up and read Ship of Smoke and Steel by Django Wexler. This is the first book in a YA series by him. I think this is his first YA book. It follows a girl named Ahsoka. Asaka. I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm gonna say Ahsoka. Ahsoka. I'm gonna say Ahsoka. <laughs> you find at the very beginning that she is very ruthless. She will do whatever it takes to protect her sister and to raise her sister's status in this society. She runs a gang in the lower parts of the city and she gives money to her sister indirectly so that her sister can be almost like an aristocrat of this world. At the beginning of the book she's found out and she is forced to go and be sacrificed to this ship of smoke and steel. It's this ghostly ship that demands sacrifices and she is going to be one of those sacrifices. The people that are sacrificed to this ship all have to have magical abilities. In this world there are nine different wells of power that people are able to access. She is able to access one that gives her swords that come out of her wrists. And different people are able to access these wells in different ways. And by that I mean that they can access more so they're more powerful. Stuff like that. And then basically she goes onto this ship and she's trying to capture the ship so that she can bring it back to the city and save her sister. I really loved the premise of this book. I really liked this ship. This ship is almost like the labyrinth in ancient Greek mythology. It is very hard to navigate. The whole myth with the Minotaur, she is sacrificed to this ship and she's trying to defeat it. So I thought that there was a lot of parallels there and I really liked those. My main issue with this is that Ahsoka changes so much, so quickly. She gets onto this ship and she finds another girl attractive and she completely changes as a person like that. She is this super ruthless person. It's starting to rain, I apologize for that. She's the super ruthless person at the beginning of the book and then she just isn't. After that, it is the weirdest thing because she goes into a more dangerous setting. Like, she could die at any time. There are tons of creatures on this ship that are wanting to kill them and she just becomes a huge softie. And I did not like it at all. <laughs> so there are a lot of elements that I liked. I liked the magic system. I liked this ship and all of that. I liked the setup of this world. I like that there's the captain and then there's this council and then the council each has their own like household. I just really think that the main character brought this novel down a ton, which is so upsetting because I was really enjoying it until that happened. And it sucks too because I do like them together, but I don't like how it was done and I don't like the changes that it made to this character. So yeah, I ended up giving this book three stars, mainly because I didn't love this change, but I liked the setting and everything like that. So maybe that won't bother you. <laughs> like if you don't get bothered by insta love and stuff like that, then I think you'll really enjoy this. One other thing that I saw people comment on was that people were getting annoyed how many times people say rotting as a curse word in this. That didn't bother me at all, but I figured I'd throw that out there because I'm not going to do an individual review for this. So got to cover my bases. After that, I reread the graveyard book by Neil Gaiman. I actually listened to the audiobook for this one because someone suggested that I read the audiobook because they thought that it was well done. I think Neil Gaiman narrates a lot of his own books. So I like seeing how he narrates his own story. If you guys don't know, this follows a little boy named Bod at the beginning of the book. His family is murdered and he is given the freedom of the graveyard and he's able to live in the graveyard and the ghosts raise him and teach him and it just follows his childhood and how he learns about the different dangers of the paranormal world as well as trying to learn as much as he can about the real world. But if you want to know more of my individual thoughts on this book, check out the review. It'll be in the card symbol. I ended up giving this one four stars. I really liked Bod. I liked the writing style. It's definitely heavily influenced by the Jungle Book, so know that before going in, but yes enjoyed this one. It takes a graveyard 
to raise a child. It turns out I did a lot of reviews for these books because I did an individual review for Age of Swords by Michael J. Sullivan. This is the second book in the Legends of the First Empire series. If you guys don't know, this follows a lot of characters that is set in the same world as his Ryeria books, but it is set thousands of years before those books take place. At the beginning of the first book, a human kills an elf, and the humans of this world originally thought that elves were gods, and so that really shakes things up. The elves have to figure out how to maintain control over the humans because the humans have been spreading population wise and now the humans are starting to realize that they've been treated so poorly and may need to fight back. With this book specifically I really enjoyed how the world was expanded. I really liked seeing more of the dwarven culture. I really liked seeing the different clans of the humans come together and try to figure things out. I didn't really love following an elf character. I can't pronounce his name. I do try in the review, so check that out if you want to. But he was a lot more frustrating to follow because he's just irritating, and he's meant to be irritating, but he was irritating me. Like the first book, I really enjoyed this one as well. I love the amount of overlap between the Ryuria books and this series happening in this book. You don't need to have read the Ryuria books to enjoy these books. You're not going to have a hard time understanding what's happening in these, but if you've read those other ones, it benefits you because you'll pick up on a lot of small Easter eggs that he includes in this series, so I love it for that. And I ended up giving this book four stars. If you want to know more of my thoughts, check out that review. I go into a lot more details of all of the new characters that we follow in this book and their roles and how I felt about them. Also, my pros and cons of, of the book in general. So check it out if you're interested. Again, I gave this one four stars. I will definitely be continuing on and reading Age of War, which is right here. Then I read Love, Anthony by Lisa Genova. I've read two books by Lisa Genova in the past. I read Inside the O'Briens, which I really enjoyed, and I also read Still Alice, which I also really enjoyed. So I figured that I would give more of her works a shot. Love, Anthony follows two characters. Olivia has recently moved to Nantucket. This book makes it very clear that it's set on Nantucket. She has recently, and by recently I mean a couple years ago, lost her son. Her son had autism and she is now separated from her husband because it's just been a huge drain on them financially and emotionally going through everything, trying to do all the treatments with Anthony and then Anthony actually passing away. And then we also follow a character named Beth. She has lived on Nantucket for quite some time. She lives there with her family. At the beginning of the book, Beth finds out that her husband has been having an affair and now they are separated. And it follows the two women who are grieving in their own ways and it starts to follow them as they're reflecting on their lives and why they didn't do X instead of Y why this has happened to them in general. I ended up not loving this book as much as I was hoping to. I ended up giving it two and a half stars. And the reason for that is that I do think that I may have had the wrong expectations going into this. I really thought that this was going to focus more on Anthony because love Anthony. It does and it doesn't. Olivia is grieving for her son, but this story focuses more on the women's marital relationships than it does on Olivia and Anthony and focusing on Anthony's autism and how Olivia felt about that and how she felt about it before, how she feels about it now. That's what I was hoping that this book would be more of, but it, it just isn't. This book is, as I said, a lot more focused on the marital status. It's a lot more focused on Beth figuring out what she's going to do now that her husband is cheated. And it also talks about Olivia and how her relationship with her husband has changed as well. It wasn't really what I wanted, which is partially my fault, partially like this book's fault. <laughs> I also didn't love that we get Anthony's story almost completely twice. I don't want to go into spoilers about why we get his story twice, but I just didn't think that it was very well done. Mm, I can't spoil anything. I was about to spoil something. Lisa Genova did a lot of research before going into this novel. She really talked to a lot of people that have had children with autism, both parents that still have their children that have autism, as well as people who have lost their children that had autism. So I do think that she did a lot of research and no child with autism has the exact same experience. Anthony in this book is nonverbal, and I've seen some criticisms on how his thoughts are written. I can't really speak to that because I don't know a lot of people with autism, but they say that it's almost like how someone would think that someone with autism would think and not exactly how someone with autism actually thinks. Don't know 
<laughs> if that's true or not, um, but that's just what I've seen on other people's reviews. But again, it does focus more on the marital status and the women than it does on Anthony. I mean, I guess at the beginning of the book he's already passed away, so that makes sense, but I didn't, that's not what I wanted, <laughs> and so I didn't really love this one. And the 70th book that I read in 2019 is The Wild Robot, which is by Peter Brown. This one follows a robot named Roz. At the beginning of the book, she is not cognizant. She is on a ship and the ship goes down. She is the only surviving robot that lands on this island and then once she's on the island she has to figure out how to survive. It's uninhabited by humans so she ends up becoming like a wild robot as she interacts with all of the animals that are on this island. She ends up adopting a gooseling and raising it and it just follows Roz as she's learning and making connections with all of these different animals and then her being a robot comes back to haunt her towards the end of the novel. Dun dun dun! That's not a spoiler, that's in the blurb. <laughs> I ended up enjoying this one. I've seen the like sales pitch of this book is like the hatchet meets Wally and I don't agree with that. I understand why they say that. It's because it's this robot surviving in the wilderness and then Robot Wally, but I don't think that it's similar enough to actually make those comparisons. She, she's a robot, so she doesn't actually have to consume anything. I feel like a big part of the hatchet was him trying to survive and take care of himself and all that stuff. Roz is a robot, so she doesn't actually have to try that hard to survive because she doesn't need food or shelter or water. I think that it gave me unrealistic expectations when going into this one, but I still enjoyed this story. I think that Roz's interactions with the animals is really sweet. I really love how far Roz will go to to help the animals of this island. She really does anything and everything that she can for people, and by people I mean animals. So I really love that. She's super caring. She's super selfless. I just enjoyed reading about her. I didn't fully love the ending, and I know this is not a standalone novel, so there is a sequel, so it makes sense that it would not be completely wrapped up in this. It's very cliffhangery, and it makes me really want the second book just so I can figure out what's gonna happen next, which is probably the point. But I wish that something had been more concretely wrapped up, or maybe just like some happiness <laughs> at the end. I ended up giving this one three and a half stars. I'm gonna cut myself off there because my battery is dying. So those are the next 10 things that I read in 2019. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up and comment down below if you've read any of these books or if you have any books that you would recommend to me. Let me know those down in the comments. Anything else you want me to know, leave it down below and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.